All right, so we're going to begin our discussion in organic chemistry uh, about looking at the atom. All right, so that's the most basic uh, part of a molecule. Uh, but before we get into that, we really need to understand the structure of the atom. So uh, currently, our best theory on uh, the structure of the atom is defined by the quantum mechanical model of the atom. So we're going to go ahead and look into that. And there are two major equations uh, that we're going to uh, kind of base our idea on uh, of this quantum mechanical um, model. And that's de Broglie's um, wave particle um, duality of matter equation. So we're actually not going to use this equation mathematically, but we're going to discuss what it means. All right. So when we look at this equation, it has the symbol lambda here, and that is for wavelength. And then we have Planck's constant here. And then we have mass for m. And then we have velocity, which is a vector. So what this tells us uh, is that all matter can exist as either a wave or a particle. All right, so that's been proven through several experiments in quantum mechanics, but that wave-particle duality can be um, looked at in this equation. And, you know, what makes this funny is that all matter can be their wave or particle. And the macroscopic scale where we exist, uh, we typically think of most matter being particle-like, all right? <clears throat> we think of um, ourselves as more of a particle than a wave. All right, so we know what a particle behaves like. Think more of a, uh, a ball. Okay, you can throw them. They bounce off of things. Uh, they don't go through walls. Uh, whereas waves, um, on the other hand, uh, they can go around surfaces and so forth. So, you know, it would seem quite funny if the Earth acted as a wave, all right, uh, rather than a particle. So, you know, we think of asteroids as particles or, you know, baseballs as particles. But waves, you know... What, what kind of matter behaves as a wave? Well, all of them do, but it all comes down to this property right here, mass, all right? So when an object becomes quite massive, all right, that mass goes up and up and up, what happens to the wavelength? It goes down and down and down and down until it becomes continuous, all right? So if we want to think about a wave, and what is wavelength, all right? So if we have a wave here, this distance between two crests is known as lambda or the wavelength, all right? So if that wavelength becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, then that wave just becomes what? Sort of a solid mass is something we would expect. So when does a particle start behaving more like a wave, all right? Well, that's when that mass number becomes tiny, all right? As the mass number becomes tiny, Remember that wavelength is inversely proportional to mass here, all right? As that mass becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, this wavelength is going to start to go up, all right? And it becomes significant. So typically, things that have significant wave-particle um, behavior are going to be things like atoms, molecules, all right, photons, all right, these types of particles are going to display what we know as both a wave-like um, property and a <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> uh, particle-like uh, capacity. All right, I'm also going to put in electrons here because that's where we're going next. All right, so electrons have a mass on the order of about 10 to the 31, minus 31 kilogram. All right, so they are very, very small. Of course, we are somewhere in the order of 10 to the one kilogram uh, as, as people. Um, so, you know, much, 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 much less massive. All right, so tiny, tiny mass particles. Therefore, these particles are going to exhibit wave and particle behavior. 
right? So that's where quantum mechanics gets really strange, right? So when do they act like waves and when do they act like particles? Well, kind of a conundrum of quantum mechanics is if they're observed as being waves, they behave as waves. If they're observed as being particles, well, they observe them as particles, all right? Or they behave as particles. So it really depends on what your observation is, right? And there have been several experiments that show um, electrons and photons and other small um, particles, if you will, acting both as wave and particles. So uh, there's the double slit experiment that kind of talks about how um, small matter can behave as waves. And then there's the photoelectric effect uh, that was pioneered by Einstein that shows particles behaving as particles. All right, so um, pretty interesting stuff, but we're not gonna get too deep into quantum mechanics here. Uh, we're just using this to really talk about um, what the quantum mechanical picture of an atom and more importantly, the electrons are gonna look like. Another equation that we're going to have to um, uh, invoke here is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And it is an equation that is accepted to be the following. All right, so it's an inequality. So what it's saying is the change in position of a particle and its product of its change in momentum is um, greater than or equal to the Planck's constant divided by two. So essentially, this whole thing here is a constant number. So what this means is as our change in position approaches zero, all right, what would that indicate? That would indicate that our change in position here, as this approaches zero or goes down, it cannot be zero for obvious reasons. We can't have it uh, not equal to the constant, all right? But as it approaches zero, gets smaller, that means the momentum change is going to get greater. And that indicates that if we try to figure out where the particle is by narrowing down its change in position, so if its change in position is zero, you know exactly where the particle is. However, we can't do that. We can get pretty darn close though. We can say it's between here and here, very small distance. All right, so that would be a very small delta x. As soon as you know where that particle is by zoning in on its change in position, the change in momentum explodes all right, into a very large number. So what that means is that we cannot simultaneously know where the particle is and where it's going. That's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So it says if we can locate a particle, it means we have a small delta x. We cannot predict where a particle is going. This is delta P large. So if you could take a picture of, a, of an electron somehow, you would have its particle location defined, but you'd have no idea which direction that particle was going into, all right? So that's a conundrum in quantum mechanics. And the opposite, of, of course, is true. If you know where the particle is going, you have no idea where it is, all right? So um, quite a, a, a peculiarity, I guess you could say, in quantum mechanics. But we can put these two together. And when we look at these two things together, what we do is we can say that electrons exist in a probable space. in an atom. All right, so let's think about that. If you just look at the hydrogen atom, you know it has one electron, but we kind of know where that electron is, right? And where we know where that electron is, we define it as something called an orbital. So many of us have seen what's called the Bohr 
uh, model of an atom. And if we look at the hydrogen atom, it has one proton, I'll color here in red, and orbiting that proton is an electron, all right? So this is kind of like a planetary model, if you will, all right? The proton would be the sun, and then the electron would be the earth, for example, and it'd be, you know, orbiting this proton. That's the Bohr model. Uh, it's, it's useful in certain arguments, but it's certainly not accepted as the uh, closest approximation to the structure of the atom we have. That's what we're talking about now, this quantum mechanical, all right? So this serves its purpose in kind of giving us an idea of, you know, where the electron would be. But what happens is if we invoke that wave-particle duality of an electron, we can imagine an electron as a wave, and we'll call it a standing wave, right? So here, what we can imagine is something like a guitar string, all right? So you have a string and we can pull that string up. So we'll pull it up in the middle, and what we'd have is something called maximum displacement. I misspelled that word. Let's just call it max displacement for now. All right, and that would be in the upward direction. So we'll put a plus sign here. Now, don't get confused. This has nothing to do with charge. It's just the upward max displacement, all right? And if we were to let that string go, what would happen next? It would then propagate eventually to the minimum displacement. Color this blue. All right, again, it's not charge, it's just the vector, if you will. So that's the negative uh, minimum displacement. And what's gonna happen, this wave, if there were no friction, would constantly propagate in a positive and negative displacement, all right, or a max and min. So what we can imagine, if this electron were treated as a wave, this would be our orbital. All right, this is the most likely place to find the electron if we treat it as a wave, all right? We can also treat it as a particle and say that particle is going to be somewhere within that orbital, all right? So these orbitals are defined um, as the most probable place find the electron. And if we treat the electron as a wave, all waves have mathematical functions, all right? Like sine waves, there's sine theta, that's its, uh, its equation. So what we can do is we can define the symbol psi, the Greek letter psi, it looks like Poseidon's um, trident there. This is called the wave function. And all electrons, depending on what kind of atom they're in, have specific wave functions. And we know the specific wave function of the hydrogen electron, all right? Um, you'll learn about that more when you take physical chemistry or quantum mechanics. We're not going to get into actual looking at wave functions, but we can define psi plus as the maximum upward displacement. And then psi minus is the minimum downward displacement. So our so-called blue color here is the psi minus and the red color is our psi plus, all right? What we can do is we can do the probability density, 
by taking psi squared, we multiply the two wave equations together. This gives us our probability density, or what chemists would call the orbital. Now, we are going to study two different types of orbitals in organic chemistry. Uh, those of you that will be taking inorganic chemistry will be looking at uh, more complex orbitals, but the two simple orbitals that we'll study, or simpler, I guess you could say, orbitals in organic chemistry are the S orbital Right. This is a spherically symmetrical orbital centered on the nucleus. So it will look something like this. If we go ahead and put the nucleus in red, which for a hydrogen atom would just simply be the proton. So this is looking a lot like the Bohr model at this time, but we have the electron has some probability of being in that spherically symmetrical orbital centered around the nucleus. Now, let's back it out and imagine, again, as a, a guitar string, all right? Going back to this guitar string, where is it most likely to be found, all right? So what I mean by that is if you pull the guitar string up, let it go, and you took a picture every half second, and you took a thousand of those pictures, where are you most likely going to see that guitar string at? Well, statistically, you would imagine to see it in the middle. All right, right here would be the most likely place to find it. And what that indicates to here, when we actually go to the orbital, the psi squared, most likely place to find this guy is in the nucleus, all right? And that's going to be quite important, all right? Think about the electron as a negatively charged particle, all right? And the proton as a positively charged particle, all right? Charges are high on the potential energy, all right? Um, scale, if you will. So when you have a charged particle, all right? Think about static electricity. As soon as you touch something, you'll ground yourself and it'll shock, right? That's because you want to get down to a lower potential energy. So that's something we're going to talk about a lot in this course. Uh, thermodynamics, um, we'll talk about later, but one thing that comes out of there is that processes tend towards lower potential energy. All right, so, you know, you hold a ball, let it go, it goes down, all right, uh, to the earth. That lowers its potential energy rather than it just spontaneously popping up, all right, which would raise its potential energy. So what that means is that if you have a negative charge near a positive charge, they're going to want to get as close together to lower potential energy. And what that indicates to us is that the closer the electron is to the proton, the lower the potential energy. So in the case of the s orbital, we're very likely to find the electron near the nucleus, which is positively charged. That's good. So what it tells us is that the s orbital has low potential energy relative to other orbitals. All right. So what are some of these other orbitals? Well, we'll get to them soon, all right? But let's just back up for a moment and talk about uh, quantum numbers, something that you saw back in general chemistry. All right, what we're gonna look at is the helium atom, or more specifically, the helium electron configuration. So if we look at the periodic table, all right, helium is the second element. 
and it has the following electron configuration. 1s2, all right? It has two electrons, and we put both of them in this 1s, all right? So what does this mean again? All right, so this 1 here, that is something called the principal quantum number. And it is given the symbol N. All right. This S here, this is called the angular momentum quantum number. And it's given the symbol L. All right, I draw it cursive so it doesn't look like a number one. And of course, this exponent or superscript, if you will, is the number of electrons in that particular set, all right? So we have two electrons that are both residing in the s orbital, all right? So there are some rules um, that these quantum numbers help us figure out, all right? So n, which is the principal quantum number, this is has the most uh, bearing uh, or greatest effect on what we would call the potential energy. So the higher the number of n, the greater the potential energy, all right? n is allowed to be numbers, or sorry, integers between one and infinity, all right? It doesn't look like a good infinity. That doesn't either. Maybe on this thing I gotta do it the old fashioned. Ooh. <laughs> there, that's a better one. All right, so it's integers between one and infinity. All right, so uh, in theoretical physics, you know, the, the, the principal quantum number can get extremely high, right? But in practice, we usually only see values between one and seven. All right, so L, which is the um, angular momentum quantum number, also has a large effect on potential energy, but not as great as that of one, all right? So L is allowed to be integers from zero to n minus one, all right? So for example, if we had n equal three, L could be 0, 1, and 2. Could not be 3, right? So it's integers between 0 and n minus 1. All right, so n minus 1, of course, is 2. So that's where we have, that's the maximum value of L. So L tells us what kind of orbital we're dealing with. If L is equal to 0, this is the so-called S orbital. If L is equal to 1, this is the p orbital, and if l is equal to 2, this is the d orbital, all right? Let's see if our n was equal to 4, all right? l could be what? It could be 0, 1, 2, and now it can be 3, all right? Because our n minus 1 would be 3. So we could have an s orbital, a p orbital, a d orbital, or an f orbital. All right, so those are kind of the classic uh, four orbitals that you've learned back in general chemistry, the S, P, D, and F orbital, all right? Just to recap, which one would have the lowest potential energy? The S, the P, or the D? Well, let's talk about that, all right? If our N was equal to three, all right, that's potential energy, we're kind of stuck there, all right? But L also has an effect on potential energy, and the lower that number, the better. So the S has the lowest potential energy, P has higher potential energy, and D even higher potential energy than that, all right? And what do I mean by potential energy? The electron hanging out in that orbital would have higher potential energy. It would be wanting to get into the P or even the S orbital if possible, all right? Remember, the electrons want to have the lowest possible potential energy that they can have third quantum number that you studied uh, in uh, general chemistry was this one given the symbol M sub L. And this is the magnetic quantum number. 
and it is allowed to have all values of minus L to positive L. Oh, pardon me, all integer values. So for example, let's see what we can do here. If n is equal to 3, L can be 0, 1, or 2. M sub L, if L is 0, M sub L equals 0. All right? So it depends on what value of L we're talking about. So if M sub L, if L equal 1, M sub L could be minus 1, 0, or plus 1. And finally, if L equals 2, M sub L could be negative 2, negative 1, 0, plus 1, or plus 2. All right? So again, M sub L depends upon the value of L. All right? So there are different um, M sub Ls for each L. All right? So what does M sub L really tell us? It tells us something about axial symmetry. And kind of to make this kind of a, I guess, layman definition, if you will, is how many different ways can you orient the orbital about the origin? So let's take a look. If we said n is equal to 1, l would then have to be equal to 0. This tells us we have an s orbital, which is the spherical orbital which is centered on the nucleus. m sub l also has to be equal to 0. All right? So what this tells us is that there are 0 different ways to orient a sphere about the origin. All right? There's only one way to do it, so your m sub l is equal to zero. But when m sub l becomes non-zero, what's happening? All right, so this is where I want to go ahead and start talking about the p orbital. And this is defined as the lobular or dumbbell. So it's classically defined like so, all right? Where we have one side would be upward displacement and another side would be downward displacement, all right? So I want you to think about this as, as a wave here, a guitar string. And if you were to put your finger on one of the frets and then pull the string, you would have a harmonic. All right. So there, what we're talking about is a node. This is where your finger would be. All right. So the P orbital has a node. And where is that node? This node is at the nucleus. So what that tells us is that we have zero probability. finding electron in nucleus, which again, where is the electron closest to a positive charge, which is the nucleus? Well, at the nucleus, right? And we can't get there in the p orbital, so what this tells us is that our p orbital's potential energy is going to be higher than that of the s orbital, which we could have predicted anyway, all right? So... A p orbital is where L is equal to 1, all right? So what that tells us is that M sub L can then be minus 1, 0, and plus 1. 
that indicates that we can put the p orbital about the nucleus three different ways, all right? The minus one orientation, the zero, and the plus one. So what does that mean? Let's go ahead and make an axis system where we're going to put y as our horizontal, or pardon me, as our vertical, x as our horizontal, and since this is three-dimensional, we can make z there. So what we can have are three different orbitals aligned about three different axes system, and that's going to be our three different p's, all right? So if we draw an orbital about the p x, all right, that would be an orbital that would look like this. All right, where it's red on one side, blue on the other. All right, so this is our so-called PX. We can also do this on the Y axis. All right, so if we had PY, it would look like this. This is our PY. And then we can have PZ. Which would be on the z axis, like so, pz. These three orbitals are considered degenerate, which means they're different, all right? They have different symmetry, but they all have the same potential energy, all right? So, where does this all come into? What do, you know, let's put all this together. Well, why don't we just go ahead and talk real quick about the carbon atom, all right? If we look at carbon and its electron configuration, its electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. All right, carbon has six electrons. So in the ground state, we fill from the bottom up the off ball principle, and we put the first two electrons in the 1s2 orbital. Oh, sorry, the 1s orbital. We put the next two in the 2s2, and then finally the last two electrons, the 2p2. All right? So if we look at neon, however, we go through its electron configuration. We see 1s2, 2s2, and then 2p6. So this is weird. All right? How are we allowed to put six electrons into an orbital, all right? We understand that you can put two, orb two electrons into any orbital, all right? But six, well, that's because if we actually expand this out, we have the 1s2, 2s2, but then we have 2px that has two of them, 2py that has two of them, and 2pz that has two of them, all right? Remember, the M sub L allows us to have the three different degenerate P orbitals. M sub L for an S orbital is equal to zero, so there are no degenerate S orbitals. There's just the only one orbital, all right? The final quantum number I want to discuss is M sub S, which is the spin quantum number. So spin is a quantum mechanical property that all particles have. All right, um, it can be thought of classically as just a particle rotating on an axis, all right, uh, for certain spin numbers. And that spin number equal one half, we can do that, all right? We can imagine the Earth rotating on its axis in one direction and Venus rotates on its axis in a different direction. So they'd have different spin numbers. So Earth would have a plus one-half, and Venus would have a negative one-half, all right? So that's very simple to think about. However, when your spin number is no longer one-half, um, that classical thought of particles spinning on an axis kind of falls apart, and it can only be described mathematically, all right? And that's kind of a, a, a trap you fall into quantum mechanics a lot. It's, it's strictly just becomes statistics and math at some point, and we have no classical model to base our thought of. So it gets weird real fast, but thankfully with uh, spin one halves, we can kind of go to the classical mechanical world and think about things that way. All right.
So M sub S it has allowed values, no matter what, of plus one half or minus one half for a um, electron. All right, because the electron has a spin number of one half. All right, this can sometimes be symbolized as a little arrow with one barb is up for spin one half or down for spin negative one half. All right. So all of that means. Put it together. If we look at the helium, the 1s2, those two electrons, what we can do is we can build an orbital diagram. But first, let's go ahead and assign all the quantum numbers. n is equal to 1. l then has to be equal to 0. m sub l is equal to 0. And m sub s for one electron would be plus 1 half. The other electron n equal 1, L equals 0, M sub L equals 0. And the only number that differs is the M sub S. This is because of the, you know, no two electrons in the same orbital can have the same quantum numbers, all right? That's the Pauli exclusion principle. So one of those electrons must have spin up, and the other electron must have spin down, all right? So if you were to draw something called the orbital filling diagram, all you would do is write 1S, Put an electron up, an electron down, all right? That's the proper way to draw the electrons sitting in an orbital diagram, all right? This would be improper because that would indicate that two electrons have the same quantum number, all right? That's not the case. All right, now we're going to move into something called hybridization. And that's how we're going to start building uh, molecules out of these atoms. All right, so if we go back to carbon. We can truncate this, what we call, electron configuration. And we're only going to look at the valence electrons. These are the electrons that are outside of the inner shell. All right, so the inner shell in this case is 1s, all right? Those electrons are not going to participate in bonding, right? Remember, bonding and um, covalent bonding is what we'll be talking about here to make molecular compounds, is the sharing of electrons, right? So the electrons will have to move um, from one atom to another, if you will, or become one in a, in a bond. Um, so we're only going to see that with the valence electrons, all right? So let's go ahead and do an orbital filling diagram for carbon. So carbon would have the 2s, and it's filled with two electrons. Now, the scaling on these orbital filling diagrams is given by energy on a vertical axis. All right, so we have the E there. So since we're talking about 2p, they have a higher potential energy. All right, so we're going to move them up a little bit higher. Now remember, we have three degenerate p's, so we'll just go ahead and randomly say px, py, and pz. All right? And remember, there's this uh, principle called Hund's rule that we're going to fill electron orbitals before we begin pairing them. All right? So what we'll do is we'll put the electron in px first, and then we'll put it in py next. Now, I just did X, Y, Z because it's alphabetical. You could have done Z, Y, X. It doesn't matter, all right? But we need to fill the orbitals before we begin pairing them. So this is what the ground state of carbon looks like um, for its electron configuration. Now, let's try to build a molecule called methane, all right? So methane is given the formula CH4. It's a carbon. Uh, with four hydrogens surrounding it. It's uh, also known as natural gas. All right, it's a molecular compound. It's the simplest carbon compound we can think of. And we know it exists. And um, we know that all the carbon-hydrogen bond lengths are the same, all right? And each one of the hydrogens is uh, identical to another one chemically, all right? So that means no one hydrogen is more reactive than another hydrogen on the molecule. So let's see if we can try to build CH4. So we'll go back to carbon's electron configuration. 
And I'm not going to even bother putting X, Y, Z on here anymore because it doesn't matter. All right? Now, remember, I filled the 2S first because it's the lower potential energy. So now we're going to take these hydrogens and let's make them red. All right? And they have 1S orbitals. And they're ready to share an electron to make a bond. All right? So what you'd imagine is this little electron in here could jump into that orbital. Cool. We'll make a CH bond that way. This guy will make a CH bond that way. But then we are out, right? Because now there's no electrons in carbon to share in that particular p orbital. Thus, we can't make more bonds. So what happens? You know, how in the world does CH4 exist? All right. Does this theory fail? No. What ends up happening is we make something called hybrid orbitals. All right, and this is basically the mixing of orbitals. So what ends up happening in the first step is carbon two s electron gets promoted. via collisional energy. So something happens, right? Carbon collides into something, some form of energy, a photon, if you will, um, you know, heat, something. And what ends up happening Carbon will promote that electron to an empty orbital. So this is the so-called promotion. So now we have four empty orbitals, which could make the bonds with the hydrogens. However, they're different energy orbitals, right? All the hydrogens are going to fight for that 2s orbital because it's a lower potential energy. And then, if that were the case, right, one hydrogen gets lucky and the other three hydrogens have to deal with 2p, right, then the hydrogens wouldn't be chemically equivalent, right? They would have different reactivities, different bond lengths, and that's just not the case that we see with methane. So something else uh, we use to explain this phenomenon is the hybridization, Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to blend the orbitals, all right? And we think about this as kind of like your recipe. You have 1s and 3ps, all right? And this is going to be a linear combination of orbitals. So we're going to take what we call four atomic orbitals, blend them up, and we're going to get four hybrid orbitals. And they get the name SP3 because they were one part S and three P, th sorry, three parts P, all right? And each one of them has an electron in them. And now they are all equal energy, degenerate, if you will, and they're different. And they can accept the hydrogen electron now and make our bond, all right? So put all of this together. The methane molecule is now comprised of four covalent bonds to hydrogen. We can actually identify what kind of bonds these are. This is covalent, sharing of electrons. It happens between a carbon that is sp3 hybridized and a hydrogen, right? That has no hybridization. What kind of orbital was used to make this bond? Just the s orbital, all right? Hydrogen does not have hybrid orbitals. It only has an s orbital, all right? All of those bonds are between a sp3 carbon and a hydrogen with an, using an s orbital, all right? So what we say here is that the carbon is sp3 hybridized.
And what this allows us to say is that it has a tetrahedral electronic geometry. All right. So next lecture, or next video, we're going to get into what these these shapes actually look like. All right. So we're not going to get into what they look like. What we're going to be doing in the next last few minutes of this video is looking at this Lewis structure, which I've drawn here of methane, and we're going to be able to identify the hybridization and electronic geometry of any atom. All right. So let's go ahead and start looking at another molecule. We'll look at the molecule methanol. So this is methanol. So hydrogen does not use hybrid orbitals, so we never consider the hybridization of hydrogen. But we're going to go ahead and look at carbon. All right, so what is the hybridization here? Do we need to go through that whole thing we just went through? No, that was just to kind of show you how this, this comes about. But what we can say is that this carbon is bonded to four things, all right? So carbon bonded to four things. All right, those four things are electron pairs, single bonds, double bonds or triple bonds. So an electron pair is a thing, a single bond is a thing, a double bond is a thing, or a triple bond is a thing. All right, so we're using things as kind of just a trick to figure out hybridization very quickly. All right, so let's go figure out how many things that carbon is bonded to. There's a thing, all right, a single bond. There's a thing, single bond. There's a thing, single bond. There's a thing, single bond. All right. So how many things? Four. So to get to four, we need an S, a P, a P, and a P. We need to use those orbitals to make four bonds. All right. Or four bonds to things. So this will equal SP3. All right. Now let's take a look at oxygen. Okay, what are the four, the things oxygen has around it? it? Has a single bond, a single bond, an electron pair, and an electron pair. So it has four things as well. So the oxygen is sp3 hybridized as well. Sppp -P -P, that gives me sp3. All right. Let's take a look at another molecule. Let's do formaldehyde. So we need our Lewis dot structure of formaldehyde. Again, we don't consider hydrogen. But let's take a look at carbon. Single bond, single bond, and double bond. All right, double bond is a thing. All right, it's not two things, it's one thing. All right, so it's three things. So what is that? It's S, P, and P. So this gives us SP2, all right? The carbon is SP2 hybridized. Whenever you see something that is SP2, it is trigonal planar electron geometry. And to recap, SP3 we said was tetrahedral, all right? It's trigonal planar, and it has three hybrid orbitals, SP2, SP2, and SP2, and one unhybridized orbital, which is the P. All right. Very important that we understand when we see this SP2 that we're talking about a trigonal planar electronic geometry. We've hybridized three orbitals, the S, the P, and the P, to make three SP2 orbitals. 
However, we left one orbital unhybridized, right? We didn't use all three. So remember, there's the S, the P, the P, and the P. We used those three and blended them up. So remember, if you use three atomic orbitals, you're going to get three hybrid orbitals out of it, all right? And this guy was left alone unhybridized, all right? To contrast that with the SP3, its electronic geometry is tetrahedral, and it has, I want to just make sure my syntax is correct, or it's consistent, has four hybridized orbitals. SP3, 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 and SP3. And it has zero unhybridized. All right. Because we took all four and blended them up. All right. So finally, we can look at the molecule hydrogen cyanide. Again, we're not going to consider hydrogen, but let's look at carbon and ask how many things is it bonded to. A single bond is a thing and a triple bond is a thing, all right? So it's two things. So we need to hybridize an S and a P, and that's it, all right? So now we have SP, and this electronic geometry is linear, all right? And it has two hybridized orbitals. SP and SP, and it has two unhybridized orbitals, a P and a P, that we did not use. So again, just to look at this, all we did was hybridize those two, and we left those two P's alone, all right? So again, we can also look at the hydrogen cyanide, and let's ask about the hybridization of nitrogen. So nitrogen, all right, it has an electron pair and a triple bond, two things, so that's an S and a P, all right? And let's go back and look at, well, not go back, let's just complete video by looking at carbon dioxide. All right. So what is the carbon hybridization? SP. Two things, right? What about oxygen? Lone pair, lone pair, double bond, SP. Two. All right. So what would be the electronic geometry at oxygen? Trigonal planar. What would the electronic geometry at carbon be? Linear. All right. So these are questions that you need to be quite uh, quick at answering. Uh, it takes some practice, but, uh, you know, I'll put out some homework assignments and uh, you need to be practicing those. But uh, reach out to me uh, if you've watched this video and you still have some questions. Um, and uh, appreciate you paying attention. Thanks a lot.